Good morning, everyone. My name is Meredith Dancos. I'm the teaching pastor here at the Meeting House, and we are continuing our series on pioneers. How do we live a different life, strike out a new path, especially as we think about these larger cultural challenges? And so today, we are talking about technology. And, and the reality is technology is a much broader definition. Technology is anything that we create that alters our world. So silverware is technology. Those of you who are sitting in a chair, that's technology. You know, your car is technology. Clothing is technology. But in our current day and age, we have a new realm of technology that we're wrestling with, and this is digital technology and social media. And it's, and it's changing the way in which we understand technology because it's now interconnected and it's interactive. And there are some of you who are digital natives. This is the only technology that you know. This is normal for you. But there are those of us, like myself, who are known as digital immigrants. And we remember a different time, the before time, when like, for example, if you wanted to know what was on television, you had to look up on your TV guide. Who here remembers? The TV guide, yep, yeah. Who here still gets a TV guide, you know? I actually looked it up, you have to subscribe now, but you, get, you, you got this, and everyone knew. You looked in this, and had everything listed, every time and date, and you, but if you lost your TV guide, for some reason, you would have to, you have to phone a friend, right? And, and who remembers when your phone used to separate, right? Yeah, and this phone, this would be wired to a wall, so like you had to go to the phone and pick it up and call your friend, right? So there was that, but if you didn't know your friend's number, because that happens sometimes, you would look in this thing called a phone book, and they were made out of paper, yeah. And, uh, and this phone book would have everyone's name and number and address listed, and you'd, you'd look through it. In fact, um, when I got married, we planned our whole wedding through the phone book because there weren't such things called websites back then. And so you had to look that up, and there goes my TV guide. Uh, and so if you, but then you'd find out when your TV show was, and you'd have to look at your calendar to know if you were available. And that was something that was paper that was on a wall, and you wrote things that were happening in, with a pen on this. And so you'd look at your calendar and schedule to see if you were available for for that show. Now, some of you may not believe this, but there was a time where there wasn't such a thing called podcasts. So, yeah, if you if you wanted to like know the li listen for like the latest music release or know the news, you'd have to listen to a thing called a radio. And sometimes you get a tape to put in that radio. And so some of you some of you know what this is, right? You remember cassette tapes. And then, you know, uh, if you wanted to take like a video of your kid or your food, something like that, yeah, you'd, you'd need one of these. And who here, who here has used one of these? Come on, let's, let's hear it. Yeah, you remember, you remember this. And so, and then, there, it's hard to believe, but like, say you wanted to watch TV. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to hold that, so you're gonna have to just put that down for me, thanks. Um, if you wanted to watch TV, you couldn't be like, I'm gonna go cook dinner and carry my TV with me. You had to watch TV wherever the TV was. Like, that's where you went, because you didn't walk around with your TV. And so now, like, if you want to watch TV in the grocery store, you can do that, and you take a video anytime you want, or whatever, you know, your food, your kid, your pet. You know, your, your calendar is always with you, and, you know, you, you have a thing called contacts on your phone. That's, that's your modern-day phone book, for those who don't, don't know what that is. And, uh, you know, your phone your, does make phone calls, in case some of you don't know that, but you can call people with it. It doesn't separate anymore, and it's not wired. Uh, and, and, you know, you just go to Apple Music if you want to listen to the latest song. And there's a thing called Google now, so you don't really need your TV guide. And all of this is now in one device that you carry around in your pocket. Right? And so technology, whether you're a digital native or a digital immigrant, technology has rapidly changed. It has moved so fast. And, and when we talk about being a pioneer in the world, when it comes to technology, it's even more difficult because technology itself is pioneering as we speak. You know, things are just changing so quickly and new things are coming out all the time. We don't know the full impact that technology is having on us because it's, it's evolving. 
as we're living in it. And I'm not here today to tell you that technology is bad. I think technology is great. Digital technology has changed our lives in so many ways for the better. There's a lot of good things. Like one thing is we can be a lot more intentional about the type of content that we take in. You know, my daughter, we, she doesn't really know what commercials are. When she sees one, she's like, whoa, they're selling stuff to me? That's amazing. Like, you know, she thinks every toy then that she sees on a commercial is the best because she's not used to them. Because we watch, we don't, we don't just watch mindless TV. We sit down and watch TV that we choose to watch. We can time shift around our, our entertainment. We're not, we're not stuck in one place. Also, it has created connection. I was out of town last week for work, and during, during that time I was able to FaceTime with my family, but also my daughter Imogen is seven, and she's now like moved beyond just silly text into actual text conversations to the point of, Dad says I can't have this, what do you say? And I was like, oh my goodness, we're triangulating over text messages now. So we've moved into this new realm, but we can stay connected to people. Her grandparents live all the way across the country, and for her, it's normal to be able to see them on a computer screen. And that, for those of us who are digital immigrants, we know that's not normal. That's not the way it always was. You couldn't always see people who are far away, right? Or you can learn so much now. You know, there is so much information available to you. You can hear from a variety of voices. If you're plumbing, like, breaks, you can just go on YouTube and learn how to Fix your plumbing or, you know, for me, I, I hate to break to you, I don't have the Bible memorized. I'm working on it. But you know, so when I'm putting a sermon together, I'm like, what's that verse that says that thing? I can Google it. And then I can look that up. And then I can look up multiple translations of it. There's sites that have the Greek all put together now. And like, you can learn whatever you want. So we live in a really awesome time. Technology is helping to save lives. It's helping us to be innovative and creative and do all sorts of things. But here's the thing, while it's great, it's not neutral. Technology is not neutral. So while it is changing the way that we interact with the world, when we interact with technology, it is also changing us. And it is no longer a matter of if you interact with technology. Because even, I mean, we used to say, oh, well then I'll just, maybe I'll just become Amish, so then I don't have technology. Most Amish teenagers have smartphones nowadays. I mean, that's, it's remarkable. So even then, because they're not wired, so that's like the caveat, that's the loophole there. So even, you know, in, in communities that used to reject technology, that's entering in. If you have a child in school, like when I was in school, computer lab was a big computer with a green screen that you played Oregon Trail or Lemonade stand on. And now, I mean, they learn through iPads and screens all the time. Uh, if you want to apply for any job, you're going to need an email nowadays. It's not a matter of if you interact with technology. So our question is, how do we interact with technology? As followers of Jesus, how do we be digital Christians? What does that look like? How do we be pioneers? How do we blaze a different trail? And luckily for us, being a pioneer has always looked the same in God's eyes. It's always been the same. And so we're going we're gonna to look at Romans 12, verse 2. If you have a Bible, you can pull that out. I'm going to show you this in two different translations because I think it really helps us see what Paul, so Paul is one of our original Christian leaders. He's writing this to a community of early believers who are trying to figure out how do I be a Christian? What does that look like? And he says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Or said in a different translation in the NLT, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so what is Paul saying to us here? He's saying, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. That word conform means to, means to be made in the shape of, to be molded after. And when he says the patterns of this world, that word world is really important because there's two different words in the Greek for that. There's one, there's cosmos, which is like the universe. It's like the big cosmic things. But he's not using that word. He's using the word aeon. And aeon means this present time, this present age. So he's saying, do not be made into the mold to be shaped after the customs of your present time. 
And so that looked a little bit different when they were writing back in biblical times what the customs of the present time were, but it's the same challenge for us. Don't be molded into, mindlessly molded into the customs of your present time. Instead, be transformed. And that word transformed means to be made new from the inside out. And so it's not just changing your behavior. It's not changing the way you act. It's saying, be so changed inside by Jesus that it reflects itself on the outside by the renewing of your mind. And that renew means to be made whole for the better, to have a complete transformation, a complete change for the better. And your mind is not just your thoughts. It's how you judge and perceive the world. So he's saying, instead of being mindlessly shaped into the patterns and customs of your current day and age, instead be so changed by Jesus on the inside That the way you judge and perceive the world, it reflects itself on the outside. And then you'll be able to test and approve God's good will. And God's will is God's desire, God's preferences, what God wants. And he says, when he says test and prove, he's like, you'll be able to see it and want it. You'll be able to see it and want to choose it because you'll know that it's good. And so our challenge to be a pioneer is the same challenge that Paul issued to the earliest Christians is to say, don't. Don't just fall into the ways of the world, you know, the customs of your day and age. Instead, as a follower of Jesus, you should be so transformed on the inside that the way you see and the way that you think and the way that you decide is changed and you want to live in the way that God lives. And so when I think about what are the current patterns of our world that if we're not careful when it comes to technology, we'll just be mindlessly shaped into. And I see four of them. So there's facade escapism, distraction, and disconnection. I want to talk about each one of these patterns. So the first one, the first one is facade. And we live in a day and age of profiles, right? Everything's a profile. Facebook has a profile. Instagram has a profile. Tinder has a profile. Even your medical records now, you create a profile, right? And you are able to edit your life and share your life with others. But the problem is we're also consuming edited lives from other people, And there's a direct correlation between the amount of time you spend on social media and your own level of happiness. They've done studies. You may like your life and be happy, and then you go spend time on social media, and afterwards you are more unhappy, right? That direct correlation for how much time you see what other people are doing, right? And and part of the challenge is the trap of a facade is that you have to keep up appearances, you're like, I'm, I'm now measuring my identity based on what other people do with the stuff that I put out there. Right? When I was a kid, you measured your popularity by like where you sat in the lunchroom. And it was kind of one of those intuitive things and kind of knew if I'm at this table, maybe I'm in between. But now kids can measure their popularity based on how many likes they get on a post. Right? And they can say, oh, this person is now liked more than I am liked. And they have more worth than I have. And if we're honest, a lot of adults do the exact same thing. And that we, we start to say, if people like what I put out there, if people like this edited version of myself, then I now have an identity, and I am worth something. And we feel like I have to keep up appearances. And you know this is true because you know this has happened to you. Someone has put a photo on a social media site, and you're like, I can't believe they tagged me in that photo. Everybody's going to see it. That is a terrible photo of me. Like, I look awful in that photo. I can tell you, I love that you get very excited about church and post pictures. Not every angle in this auditorium is flattering. So I sometimes go on Facebook. I'm like, oh, man, everyone's going to see that. That is not a good picture, right? We all feel that. That, like, I want, I want to always be presenting my best self. I want people to be approving of me. I want people to like me. And we measure ourselves against each other to win the approval of the masses. That's this pattern, this mindless pattern of facade. And so what does being a follower of Jesus, what does that say to us? How does that help us not fall into that trap? And Paul says in Romans in another place, he says this, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your identity is set. It is already established. Your acceptance is already established. If we want to not fall into the pattern of facade, and keeping up appearances, and assuming that if people like, like me, then, then I'm worth something. We need to start with our identity in Jesus. What would it be to put that passage on your mirror? And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this when I get home. Put that passage on your mirror, and it's the first thing you look at every morning. Before you answer an email, before you answer a text, before you check a social media site, you look and say, if God is for me, who can be against me? It does not matter how many likes I get today. It does not matter if someone approves of me or not. I am already approved. And what would that be to do that with our kids every single day? I want to remind you before you go out into high school today who you are. Your identity in Jesus is already set. If God is for you, it doesn't matter who is against you. If he did not spare his son, he will not spare anything for you. He loves you. And if we don't get that right, it doesn't matter how many boundaries we put around technology and how many other things we try to do. If your identity is not already established in Jesus, then we're already losing. That's the number one thing. Every single day to remind ourselves, I already know who I am. That is already decided. No one else gets to decide that for me. That's the first thing that we have to get right. But then our second cultural pattern is this of escapism. And this is using technology in order to, you know, keep ourselves away from feelings of boredom and loneliness and meaninglessness. And we just fill our time. You can fill every spare moment with something with digital technology. We have games on our phone. We have social media sites. You can text. You can email. Some of us have started to look at Amazon like it's a news site rather than a store. Like, oh, I wonder if there's anything new on Amazon. It's just a store, right? There's not anything really new there. And then you know, think about it. If you are at a restaurant and, and the person you're at the restaurant with gets up to use the restroom, what do you do? You pull out your phone, right? You're like, well, maybe someone got in touch. I don't want, I, heaven forbid, I have to look around the restaurant. That would be terrible, right? I don't, want, I don't want to be bored in this moment or make eye contact with a stranger. That would be so weird. And so we distract ourselves with this. We keep escaping from every moment. We have white noise on all the time. We listen to podcasts in the shower when we're cooking, when we're driving. We have stuff all the time. And what they're finding is our imagination is going down. Our innovation is going down because every great innovation, every great invention and creation was, was happened in a blank moment, in a moment where someone was looking up at the world and said, huh, that doesn't make sense. I wonder how we could fix that problem. Or, oh, look at that thing and that thing. I wonder what it would be to connect those things. We don't let our minds wander. And so what does this look like for us to not just escape from our lives and fall into this pattern of constantly being uh, preoccupied with something so you don't have to feel what's actually going on in this moment. Well, Paul says to a different community, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Rather than escaping our lives as followers of Jesus, we are called to be present to our lives. And what does it look like to be present? It means to always be joyful, to never stop praying, to always be giving thanks. And you can only do those things if you are paying attention, if you are present to a moment. Those things don't happen passively. They're active things that we choose to do. And so what does this, what does this mean for us to be present in our lives? There's, there's some ways that we can actually use technology to do that. So there's a rule, one family, one screen. One family, one screen, meaning if, if we're together as a family, we only use one screen together rather than everyone being on their own screen. So yesterday, uh, I, we've been listening. Steve and I had seen the movie for a while ago, but we've been listening to the soundtrack for The Greatest Showman. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. But it just came out, and I told Imogen that we were going to watch it together. Right? And she was so excited that we were going to watch it yesterday afternoon. And so, but then we also had friends over, and they came over, and they watched it. And there was a whole group of people having an experience together, watching a movie together. And it wasn't all of us zoning out and just trying to escape from a moment. It was 
it was enjoying something with one another. So it doesn't, screens don't have to be escape. We can use them to connect. But if we also want to be present to our lives, we need things that are not screens, right? Do you have hobbies that don't involve a screen? Do you do puzzles? Do you knit? Do you run? Do you exercise? Do you cook? You know, whatever it is, you can do all sorts of things, but something that involves your senses, that makes you aware of the world around you. Have something else to do. Do a crossword puzzle, whatever it is, but have something that lets you be present to the moment. And then when we face those hard times, when we are lonely, or we do feel like we're drifting, or things feel meaningless, or they feel hard, rather than turning to Candy Crush, turn to prayer. You know, what does it mean to, instead of saying, oh, I'm just going to try to zone out and hope this just passes, and I'll wake up and it'll be gone, so to say, I'm going to invite God into this moment, and for however long it takes, I'm not going to escape it, I'm going to pray through it. I'm going to look for things to be grateful. I'm going to start to be present to my life. The third cultural pattern goes hand in hand with, dis- with escapism and it's distraction. You know, and we are more and more distracted by our phones and our devices than ever before. So a study found that the average person touches their cell phone up to 80 times per day. And if you are a high schooler or a teenager, that's about 150 times per day. And we only go about an average of four minutes before we check our phone. So if you have yet to check your phone yet during the sermon, you have gone longer than average way to go. I mean, you might have used it for your, for your uh, Bible. But if you haven't checked your messages, you've gone longer than average. And the reality is the average person underestimates by 50% how much they spend on their phone. We don't even have a good sense of how much time we're actually giving to our devices. In fact, Microsoft did a study a few years ago, and they found that the human attention span had moved from 13 seconds to 8 seconds, which is one second less than a goldfish, which means that a goldfish can pay attention longer than most people. And goldfish are not known to be the brightest animals on the planet. So that is not good. That's not good news for humanity, what's happening, we're getting more and more distracted because we're starting to create this relationship with our devices. And there's always an alternative, so it keeps our brains preoccupied. In fact, they found, they did another study with college students, and just the presence of a cell phone reduced their cognitive function. So they brought college students into a room, and they let some of them bring their cell phone in with them. It wasn't even on the table, just in their bag, but it was present. And they had another group where they weren't allowed to bring their cell phone in, and they gave them basic math problems to do. And to a person, the one with a cell phone in the room did worse than the one without a cell phone. We get dumber when our smartphones are around. You, you can, your basic cognitive function goes down because your brain is distracted. Because your phone contains everything, right? There's anything that you could possibly want to look up. There's every person that you could possibly want to contact. So our brain is constantly being distracted. And it's mobile, so it's starting to insert itself into our lives. It can, it can disrupt your daily rhythm at any point. You can be doing something, and then suddenly it dings. And we've all had this where you're talking to someone, and then your, your phone texts, and you're like, I'm trying to listen, but I should probably check that because maybe someone lost an arm or something. And they'd probably text me if they were doing that rather than call. I mean, we go to this like, I, there's, it's over there. And these notifications, every time your phone gives you a little notification, what happens is you get a little dopamine hit in your brain. That's the reward center and your brain goes off. You think, oh, I'm important. Or something exciting happened. Like, oh, my Amazon package arrived. Oh, the weather changed by one degree. This is amazing. Uh, but there's a thing called the hedonic treadmill, which means you, you get rewarded at this level and then it doesn't feel as good. So then you need more. You need another dopamine hit. And then you need more. And then you need more. And then you're stuck in this compulsion loop, which is why we check our phones compulsively, even if there's nothing that's changed, why we can't even go four minutes without saying, I wonder if something new happened. Because our brain is looking for that reward center to light up. It's distracting us. It's causing us to be anxious people. And so we're impatient. Technology is programming us to respond to it. And so what does this look like? How do we do something different as followers of Jesus? Peter, who is one of the original disciples of Jesus, he was with him from the beginning. He writes this. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. 
So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living and satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who, cho- who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Peter says, as a follower of Jesus, be obedient. Be, be ready for action. Exercise self-control. Have hope. Pay attention. Jesus keeps telling his disciples over and over, keep watch. Keep watch. Keep watch. You don't know when God is going to show up. Stay alert. Stay awake. You know, Besides just escaping and being present, we also need to pay attention. We need to open up our eyes with expectation. And distraction keeps us from paying attention. We're always looking at something else. We're not paying attention to what God is up to. The call of the Christian is to be someone who is on the lookout for the kingdom of God. So what does it look like to live as someone who is alert? The first thing is whenever you feel that compulsion to check your phone, stop yourself and ask why? Why? Why am I doing this right now? Is it because I'm uncomfortable? Is it because I'm bored? Is it because I don't know anyone? Is it because I'm waiting for something? What? Why? And, and sometimes stop yourself and say, I don't, I don't need to do that. Have screen-free zones in your home. Have screen-free times in your life where you turn your phone off. I know some of you are like, "Um, I only turn my phone off when it's starting to malfunction, and then I panic for like the five seconds that it takes to reboot because something important could have happened in that five seconds, right? We don't turn our phones off because we've been trained to say, this. you should be on alert all the time. We're paying attention to the wrong things. We keep looking for the wrong things. If you have deep work to do, and I've started to do this myself, if you have deep work to do, put your phone in a different room because you can't do deep thinking when your phone is around. Your cognitive function gets lower. You're distracted. You know, do a digital detox. They've done studies on this where people go away and they have no devices at all and their stress and their cortisol level goes way down. Our devices are stressing us out. So choose to live attentive to the right things and stop being programmed to the wrong things. And the last thing, the last cultural pattern that I see is disconnection. And while social media and technology is awesome because it does allow us to be connected to people all around the world, it has also increased our disconnection with one another. For example, on Friday I was in the grocery store and the woman in front of my husband and I had this very large order. So it wasn't just like a couple items. It was a large order. And she literally stayed on her phone the entire time, didn't look at the cashier in the eye, never greeted her or said hello, paid for her order, walked away, had left a bag. And so the cashier's like running, chasing her down. The woman's not even paying attention because she's on her phone, gives her the bag. And the whole time never acknowledged the person in front of her. I was at um, lunch the other day, and, and the person in front of me stayed on their phone the whole time they were ordering. I mean, when we... They've done studies where even with someone that you love, if a phone is between the two of you when you're talking, you feel less connected to that person. You feel like that person cares less about you. Even if that's not what, what they really feel, it feels like, oh, someone else is more important. And so we are disconnecting from each other. We are not acknowledging people's humanity. How hard is it to turn our phones off when we go into a grocery store and say, I'm just, I'm going to be present here. I'm going to leave my phone in the car. There's moments where we, we stop looking around and seeing each other. We started to treat people who are in service industries like they're our servants rather than they're another person because we're so disconnected from one another. In addition, we start to say things on social media that we would never say in person. We co- we've learned to comment on other people's thoughts rather than dialogue with people's thoughts. And we make comments because there's not proximity or there's anonymity. And we say things that we wouldn't say if we could actually see that person's reaction. We consume things that we wouldn't consume. We allow things to come through our screens that we would never allow to come through our front door. Things that make us less sensitive to the cares of other people. Make us less thoughtful about how other people might be feeling. They desensitize us to the suffering of others. And so what does this look like to not live as someone who is disconnected? Because here's the thing. Most social media is utilizing fear 
It's a race to the bottom to see what's the, what is the lowest common denominator that I can put out here to keep people on social media for a longer period of time. It's not showing us the best of humanity often. It's normally preying on our fears and showing us the worst so that we stay longer, so they can sell us more stuff. That's what's happening, right? And so it's, it's robbing us of our ability to see one another and care for one another. And so we have to ask, what does it mean to be a good digital citizen? What does it mean to be a good digital citizen? Because now you're not just a citizen of your town, and you're not just a citizen of this. You are a citizen of a digital community. And as Christians, how do we be a good digital citizen? And I think the first place to start is, is what Jesus says. He tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children, the children of God. Jesus tells us that we are called to be people who bring peace and keep peace. Because we have to remember, those of us who are followers of Jesus, our primary citizenship is to the kingdom of God. That's your primary citizenship. So if you want to know how to be a good digital citizen, you say, what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? And Jesus says it is to bring and keep peace. And so we should be asking ourselves always, is what I'm about to do is going to break peace? Is it going to keep peace? Is it going to bring about peace? Peter, again, is a follower of Jesus. He says this, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good, and they must seek peace and pursue it. Our conduct on every social media platform should be something that brings about peace and goodness. It should be something that brings, brings about blessing to others and builds others up. It is not about building ourselves up. It is about building up others. And so we need to first stop and ask ourselves, am I taking in content that degrades other people? Am I, am I visiting websites or listening to podcasts or watching news streams that speak down to other people and demonize someone who thinks differently than me? Because that only creates further disconnection. And as Christians, we are to come back and say, Jesus died for every single person. He made them and died for them, and there's no one that is not worth it worth his salvation. There is no one that is my enemy. That person, they might think differently, but they are not my enemy. And if anything that we are consuming creates enemies out of each other, then we need to stop consuming that because it just furthers the disconnection as being shaped into the pattern of this world rather than into the pattern of Jesus. And we need to go out of our way to build, to build peace, to be bridge builders, and so if, it, if we're about to make a comment that we know that's just going to create polarization and it's going to break peace, I should not make it. Because my primary allegiance is to the kingdom of God. That is my citizenship. We are called to be peacemakers. That's who we are. If we want to move out of disconnection and into, into connection. So what does it mean to be a pioneer? It means to not be mindlessly shaped into the patterns of this world. The patterns of our current present digital age. It is to live differently. It is to take the teachings of Jesus seriously and to say, I'm going to let them transform me from the inside out so I choose God's way, so I want to choose God's way. So that the way that I perceive others and the way that I perceive the world is different than, than how others do that. And so whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, wherever you are on that spectrum, I would challenge you, what would it be to put these teachings into practice? to try to be someone who is different when it comes to technology. You don't have to necessarily believe his claims about who he is in order to live out his teachings, but try this. And I wanna, I wanna live, leave us all with both an aspiration and a challenge as to how we should be filling our hearts and our minds when we have every type of content available to us and we can respond any way in which we want Hear these words that Paul wrote to the community in Philippi. It says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. What if that was our litmus test for how we engaged in digital media? 
Is it worthy? Is it noble? Is it admirable? Is it beautiful? Does it bring about peace? Let that be the challenge for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for the day and age in which we live. We are grateful for the reality that technology saves lives, that it creates connection, that there's so much possibility because of it. But we are also aware, Lord, that if we are not careful, we can be shaped by it in a way that does not shape us into your character. And so I pray that you would teach us to be good digital citizens, that you would teach us to be peacemakers, Lord, that you would show us that we don't need to put up a facade, but that our identity is already set in you, that we don't need to escape from whatever is going on in our world, Lord, that we can turn the white noise off and tune into you and be aware and alert, God, that we don't need to be distracted, but that we would pay attention and be on the lookout for your kingdom. And God, rather than being disconnected from one another, that we would look and see the humanity in each other and acknowledge it and bring that about. Help us to be peacemakers and peacekeepers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.